that I've gotten published, but this is also my first time uh, speaking at an academic conference. So this is kind of a win-win for me. So anyway, the paper that my colleague and I published was called Populism on the American Left, How Populism is this Electorate by my colleague Patrick Sawyer, who unfortunately cannot join us, and myself, Alex Moore. So uh, next slide, please. Just a second to fix everything I'm doing at the same time. No worries. All right, so I'll start off with an introduction and you know, here are the key words that we had in our um, you know, paper. So again, next, next slide. Please. Uh, it, yes, right here. So, so again, so since the 2016 election, there has been, we have noticed this um, rise of populism within the USA. And oftentimes this is attributed to Donald Trump's election, but there is also this narrative within the US that um, Bernie Sanders is a populist and that basically we're seeing this sort of populism versus populism among left-wing populism with Bernie Sanders and right-wing populism with Donald Trump. But I, there have been a few scholars who have kind of challenged this and that a lot of, and have pointed out that a lot of um, commentators are sort of misattributing the term populism to refer to anyone who is uh, an outsider or, uh, or whatever, because what we noticed is, is because what, one of the most common themes that people brought up is that well Sanders has this sort of anti-elitist uh, sentiment towards him which is pretty typical of populism um he doesn't typically have an anti-liberal stance with populism and we'll go more into this um, as the presentation goes on but an anti-liberal stance typically refers to sort of like an anti-liberal institutions uh, which are typically um, existence within populist we'll go more into definitions of populism in a minute, along with this sort of like moralistic um, aspect of populism, which Sanders seems to be lacking within his his rhetoric. And so next slide, please. So we're going to start off by looking at left wing populism within the USA. So left wing populism has a long history, but um, one of the first noticeable ones was the People's Party led by Huey Long of Louisiana in, in the left, which he provided a left wing critique of FDR. And while we have seen left wing populist movements decline and rise and decline within the US from time to time, um, Occupy Wall Street, um, which, uh, which came about after the economic recession of 2008 is generally seen as this um, emergence of left wing populism within the US that sort of took the mainstream and sort of took the um, sort of captured the American mind because. Again, because one of the a few of the key aspects of Occupy Wall Street was they had this idea of these, these elites being both corrupt and homogenous with each other. And also this idea of like inclusive inclusivity with the people of of Occupy Wall Street, like the idea of there being this, um, you know, human microphone to relay the messages to people in the back and et cetera. And a lot of commentators have noted that the rhetoric of Occupy Wall Street um, has been used by Bernie Sanders in his 2016 campaign and even still today with 2020. But we're, we're focused on 2016 here. So uh, next slide, please. So populism. So the pop, the way we conceptualize populism in this paper is based primarily on Cass Mood, who argues that populism is essentially a thin centered ideology that considers society to be ultimately separated into two homogenous antagonistic groups the quote, pure people versus the corrupt elites. And it argues that politics should be an expression of the general will of the people. 
Now, thin-centered means that populism requires a host ideology in order for it to attach itself to. So basically, there is no such thing as anyone who is only a populist because a pop because populism does not provide enough of a, a world view it, it has to have like a, a socialist populism or a uh, fascist populism or a uh, liberal populism or conservative populism even centrist populism um also again populism believes in the of the people by the people for the people and that what this means is that basically the people are justified in replacing politicians that they see are not properly representing them. Also, it has been noted that this perceived lack of popu popular sovereignty results in many emotions, but one of the, the key emotions that exists within populism is anger. And again, anger, this results in some sort of perceived threat or harm that, that is either a result of negligence or intentional behavior from these corrupt homogenous elites against the, you know, quote, pure people that populist uh, ideology tends to believe. So uh, next slide, please. Also populism tends to have a Menetian worldview. And basically what Menetian means is like it's a struggle between good versus evil. So not only are the elites corrupt, and basically, because here we have an example from Huey Long who said, I never read a line of Marx or Henry George or any of the economists. It's all in the law of God. So again, he's using this idea of like this good versus versus uh, the the pure good people versus again the evil, and basically, um, so because of this, populists tend to employ a rather sort of emotional language to describe their opponents, and this is and this is one reason why we believe that um, a lot of scholars tend to mistake populism as sort of this. Um, style as opposed to an ideology because one it does rely very heavily on the language and two because it's this thin centered ideology and requires a host ideology basically like um th this is basically why a lot of people kind of tend to mistake it as a matter of style as opposed to an actual uh, ideological worldview belief so mm -hmm. next slide please So here we have a diagram that we um, basically reproduced um, to give us an example of populist attitudes with anti-elitism, uh, people centrism, general will, and Manchianism, and how they um, correspond with different um, political political family party families. Now this was done within continental Europe, not the USA, but um, but this was an example that we used for basically demonstrating how these populist trends do uh, sort of exist within these political families. Um, and basically because the will of the people and because the populists see this as a good versus evil, they see compromise as not an option because opponents are this moral existential threat and therefore you cannot compromise with the with the evil. Um, and basically, again, as I said before, the will of the people should prevail at all costs. In liberal institutions such as independent media, separation of power, rights for minority, they should not override the will of the pure majority. And that if these sort of interfere with the will of a the majority, then the will of a majority should supersede this and bypass um, these liberal institutions, basically. Um, next slide, please. So again, if we look at left wing populism versus right wing populism, left wing populism tends to be more inclusive and egalitarian, and it also um, 
sees extending its rights to minorities, to women, and other historically disenfranchised groups, such as indigenous peoples or um, immigrants. And it also sees that this sort of idealized heartland of the pure people that existed, uh, of basically like common folk workers that existed before this um, perceived betrayal of neoliberalism and the center left, basically, that uh, sort of sold out their ideas, if if we want to use that language for how left wing populism sees it, whereas right wing populism typically tends to see the pure people as being the native population and typically do it doesn't necessarily include a, a more egalitarian view with regards to extending these to um, certain disenfranchised groups. And while there are a number of social populists, um, such as in Eastern Europe, who do have anti-immigrant sentiments, um, they this is not a core value, a core idea of their people versus elite dichotomy. So this wouldn't necessarily make them a, a full-on right-wing populist party. So next slide, please. Okay, so now... I'm going to go into a bit of a history of the American left with social democracy, uh, left libertarianism, and the Sanders electorate. So, next slide, please. So, social democracy. Now, the reason why we decide to focus on social democracy here is because while Sanders labels himself as a democratic socialist, he does point to the social democracy of the Nordic countries as a model for the US to follow. So typically what social democracy holds is that liberal democracy both works and is desirable over communism and that capitalism modernization are both inevitable, but they still understand that there are shortcomings, there are pitfalls of this, and they try to use more um, social welfare policies and some government regulations to try to alleviate these problems. Um, now, social democracy does still hold a bit of an elitist status top down approach with relationships to the state and the people because social democracy ultimately believes that it's the government that's going to be um, fixing these problems for the people. So it's they tend to have a more um, a top-down approach. Um, they also tend to favor corp corporate corporatism and, and the idea that markets play an active role in employment and social welfare. Now, it's been noted that social democrats have largely abandoned a lot of these views in favor of more third-way new democrats. Um, and this was because during uh, so-called stagflation, um, Keynesian economics was people were beginning to have doubts with it, basically. And as a result of this, the Democratic Party began to lose a lot of elections due to them nominating more left wing progressive candidates. So after Bill Clinton's victory, this reinforced the idea within the Democratic Party that centrism was the way to win elections. And thus, this third way approach was the um, the direction that the Democratic Party should uh, go in from this day from from now on, not this more traditional uh, social democracy view. Next slide, please. So left libertarianism. So left libertarianism is sort of this, um, I guess you could say, umbrella term for um movements that sprung out from the new left and the new social movements um and the uh post-materialist view values that they adopted because it's been noted that uh newer generations who grew up with more economic security they tend to focus more on self-expression as opposed to these materialist values of survival that the old left and that their parents and grandparents may have um shared and that like instead of focusing on improving standard of living as the old left valued this uh new left was focused more on improving the quality of life 
and as opposed to um and as opposed to this they the new left didn't really see economic growth as the sole priority but rather policies that um were expanded more individual autonomy and popular participation and as a result they tend to favor um they tend to be um on side with new social movements such as second wave feminism or uh, homosexual rights or uh, anti-war movements or uh, drug legalization movements, rights for indigenous movements in the environment, et cetera, et cetera. So next slide, please. Now the Sanders electorate. Now this is a quote made from Joe Biden in 2020 that discussed Sanders impact on the uh, electorate um, because Senator Sanders and his supporters have changed the dialogue in America. Issues which had been given little attention or little hope of ever passing are now at the center of the political debate. Income inequality, universal health care, climate change, free college, relieving students from the crushing debt of student loans. These are just a few of the issues Bernie and his supporters have given life to. So again, this is even the more uh, quote establishment uh, uh, side of the left acknowledging uh, Sanders impact on the electorate and on the the voter base. Now Sanders when he ran in 2016 he did have similar views with the more traditional Democratic Party and his rival Hillary Clinton with regards to gun control and immigration policies but he deferred in his attacks towards the rich and the on regular financial sector and the so-called Washington establishment and the uh, multinational corporations, etc. So, and part of Sanders' appeal to the younger voters was because Sanders had this image of consistency um, throughout his entire political career, and he was, and thus he was not seen as a, a quote uh, sellout with his values. He he was a man, he was seen as a man who stuck to his values and stuck to his ideas as opposed to someone who was just trying to win elections and win votes. Basically, and that's why a lot of the younger voters were ha, were more drawn to Sanders. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So this will discuss our methodology and our and our strategy and the variables which we used. So next slide, please. So <clears throat> our empirical strategy is we'll be using two regression analysis. So the first one will analyze the strength of populist attitudes within the Sanders electorate and, and how this is relative to other ideologies which are typical of a Sanders voter such as um, social Democrat values and uh, left libertarian values. And we will also look at the second regression analysis. We'll focus on the strength of populist attitudes, which are relative to the other political candidates in the 2016 primary. So these candidates include um, Bernie Sanders, um, Hillary Clinton, John Kasich, uh, Marco Rubio, uh, Ted Cruz and Donald Trump. And the data was collected from uh, 2016 American National Election Studies. Um, they composed of 1,180 face-to-face -face interviews and um, and 3,090 in internet interview questions. So a total of 4,270 questions, uh, um, I interviews, sorry. And now it, it should be known that not every respondent was asked the same question. And some response refused to answer, so that was taken into account with this um, analysis. So, next question, please. I mean, next next slide, please. So, based on how we we looked at how um, how can we operationalize populism with regards to these uh, survey questions that were on ANES. So. We we looked at operational operate operationalization techniques that have been used by other scholars, and we came up with seven variables for uh, 
defining populism within the ANES uh, survey. So the first is um, refers to the belief that the will of a majority should always prevail. And this um, goes into populist beliefs of popular sovereignty. The second one asks um, uh, how many politicians they believe to be corrupt, with the highest um, being all of them are corrupt. Whereas, um, and this this is to take into account the the idea of anti elitism, along with the homogeneity of the the so called corrupt elites that populism believes. The third is um, whether they agreed that people, not politicians, should make most important policy decisions. Um, so this this ties into the uh, people centric view of populism. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the fourth one is um, whether they believe that compromise in politics is selling out one's principles. This is this goes into the zero sum game that populists view that good versus evil and that if you compromise, then you're quote um, selling out your views and that a, a real populist will never sell out their views because they're up against evil. Um, fifth one asks whether they believe that government is run by a few large interests. So again, going back to the anti elitism and popular sovereignty attitudes. Six one asks whether respondents agree that most politicians do not care about the people. And this again goes into the um, ideas of homogeneity, anti elitism, mor morality, et cetera. And finally, we uh, it asks um, whether they agree with the following statement. What what our country needs is a strong, determined leader who will crush evil to take back take us back to our true path. So again, this is the idea that populists have of not compromising and going back to this uh, uh, heartland pure people that was uh, taken away from us by these uh, corrupt elites, basically. So um, next slide, please. So our dependent variables were dichotomous to those who voted for Sanders within the 2016 Democratic primaries. Also, they they did include those who abstained from voting, and this used a uh, logistic regression analysis. The second test measures the populist attitudes among the Sanders electorate. Um, so the populist scale in previous two slides, which is used for the OLS regress regression analysis. The first test primarily focuses on attitudes compared to those of other worldviews within the American left, such as the left libertarians and the social Democrats, and along with populist attitudes and the Sanders electorate. And again, the same populist attitudes are used here. And we, we control with social democracy and the left libertarian values for in contrast with these populist attitudes. And Controls are also added for income, education, uh, the ideology, again, the left libertarian, social democrat, gender, uh, white voters, age, and whether the respondent considers themselves to be an independent voter or not. Next slide, please. Ah, oh, okay, so. Uh, the second test, same variables were, are used for those who voted for Bernie Sanders as the independent variables. Um, we also look for votes for Hillary Clinton, John Kasich, Rubio, Cruz, and Donald Trump. They're used as controls. Um, but this and this is the goal of this test to predict the likelihood of an individual holding populist attitudes and um, and who they will tend to support, basically. Um, um, all previous mentioned controls along with social democracy and left libertarian are used as well. And also to control for the right or for certain factions within the right, we also looked for uh, support for authoritarianism because, um, and this was based on social conformity, autonomy, and uh, scale based Steiner and Feldman. So, next slide, please.
OK, so here is basically uh, an example of our variables. I've already gone over the populist variables, but again, social dem democratic values. Uh, do you favor or oppose? Neither favor nor oppose increasing income taxes on people making over one million dollars. Uh, should federal spending on welfare programs be increased or decreased or kept the same? How much government regulations of business is good for society? Left libertarian scale, do you consider yourself a feminist? Do you think the federal government should be doing more about rising temperatures, should be doing less, or is currently doing the right amount? Uh, generations of slavery and discrimination have increased created conditions that make it difficult for blacks to work their way out of lower out of lower class, agree or disagree. With the authoritarianism scale, we looked at, um, um, please tell me um, which one you think is more important for a child to have, independence or respect for elders. Uh, which one's more important for a child to have, curiosity or good manners? Which one is more important for a child to have, being considerate or well behaved? Uh, next slide, please. Again, I already adjusted the populism variable. So, again, social dem democracy. How would you rate labor unions? Where would you place yourself on this scale? Private healthcare, government healthcare. Uh, how much more or less should government do to regulate banks? How willing should the United States be used to force force uh, should to be used military force to solve international problems? What should government policy be towards unauthorized immigrants now living in the United States? Do you favor oppose or neither favor nor oppose the use of marijuana being legal? And the last authoritarian one, which one's more important for a child to have obedience or self-reliance? And next slide, please. And again, the last populist um, variable. So again, next slide, please. And so the results. So next slide, please. So we, what we found is that populist attitudes are generally not a significant uh, predictor for a Bernie Sanders supporter. So the we did see what we did see was more ideology, particularly with left libertarianism and social democracy, indicating that the Sanders voters skew very heavily to the left as opposed to um, have, uh, skewing more towards populist values. Now, it should be noted that there were some Sanders supporters who did hold populist attitudes. But um, while we saw that social democracy and left libertarianism hold po positive correlations within both the voter cohorts of left libertarian and social democrats within the Sanders coalition, but the populist variables were a weaker predictor for the Bernie Sanders supporters as opposed to the more ideology aspects of social democracy and left libertarian values. Um, so basically, so while Sanders supporters generally do not hold populist attitudes, there is a small smaller but significant cohort of voters who do. But it should be noted that the populist voters within the Sanders electorate who who did support Sanders, they were less le left leaning than the um, Sanders supporters who did not hold the populist va values and were more ideology based and that the ideology based Sanders supporters outweighed the more populist ideology aspect of the Sanders supporters. Um, by uh, quite a bit, actually. So next slide, please. So again, the second series of testing, we found negative results with controls for education, income and ideology, which showed like with regards to supporting populism. Um, Hillary Clinton and John Kasich also showed negative relationships with populism, which isn't really too surprising because, you know, they're part of the quote establishment. So populists typically would not see to support them. Um, but those who voted for Donald Trump did show a much stronger relationship with populist attitudes. And also when authoritarianism was factored in, 
along with social democracy and left libertarianism with populism on the left and right. Uh, social democracy was null, but left libertarianism was strongly negative against populist attitudes. But authoritarianist views did demonstrate a positive relationship with populist attitudes. So basically the the variables for Bernie Sanders supporters do become more more positive when authoritarianism adds to the variable which um, denoted to Donald Trump supporters, which don't change when authoritarianism is factored with um, regards to uh, populism. So, and we see, we'll see a negative correlation of left-wing ideology and strong positive relationship with authoritarianism. This seems to demonstrate that populism within the US skews to the right of the political spectrum as opposed to the left. And um, so basically, with variables um, for the general populist scale, two are negative, while populism two, five, and six are positive. With Bernie Sanders, well, well, Donald Trump, however, correlated with five of the seven populist variables. So again, next slide, please. So here we see some of the results for this. Now, um, unfortunately, my colleague is not here to um, address this because he is more the quantitative side of this paper, whereas I was more the qualitative side. But this basically um, was showing the logistic regression of votes for Bernie Sanders during the 2016 uh, presidential primaries with regards to populist attitudes and the ideologies and the um, you know, the variables, etc. The next slide, please. Again, we can also see right here too um, the matrix of Sanders supporters and their um, you know, their covariates with the variables. And when an X is shown here, it shows that's not statistically significant among the um, among the Sanders supporters with regards to the um, populism and the you know, populist attitudes and their uh, more ideology attitudes. So next slide, please. And again, this is uh, the results of our OLS regression analysis with the um, when we looked at the populist attitudes among the Sanders supporters versus the uh, populist attitudes among Clinton, Kasich, Rubio, Cruz, and Trump supporters. And if you go to the next slide, you can see Donald Trump's rating. Sorry, I cannot fit it all on one slide. <laughs> again, here we see Trump, and again, all of the other variables which are mentioned as well. And um, next slide, please. <laughs> And again, this is just some more info here. Next slide, please. And this was this was also included in our appendix. Basically, this was just uh, extra info for the with regards to the OLS regression of disaggregated populist attitudes during the 2016 uh, presidential primaries. And next slide, please. And also again, just some descriptive statistics for our data also included in the appendix of our um, paper. Mm, next slide, please. And so finally, that brings us to the conclusion of this paper. So next slide, please. OK, so what we found is that populism or populist attitude seems to be really only a minor factor within the Sanders electorate and that it tends to be more the values with regards to social Democrats and left libertarian values are much more prominent within the uh, Sanders voter base. And while there is a small populist voting bloc within Sanders, um, we see less left. We, we see them have less left wing 
um, ideas and lower levels of education compared to the uh, largest voting bloc, which are the left libertarians. And this also showed that the largest voting bloc within the Sanders electorate, the left libertarians were um, anti-populist in their views. So um, correlations for populism among Sanders supporters were only after um, correlations for traditional left-wing factions were added, but this was much less so for Donald Trump. And only anti-elitist sentiments were significantly correlated with Sanders, while Menentianism, people centrism, and majoritarianism were not present within Bernie Sanders, whereas Donald Trump supporters consistently correlated positively with nearly all of these aspects of uh, populist ideologies. So I believe that's the end. Um, next slide, please. And yes, that's it. Thank you very much for your time and uh, questions. Thank you very much, Thank you. Alex, for this very interesting presentation. Um, very, very interesting methodology too. Um, that uh, that uh, comes up to you know both quantitative and qualitative data and uh, findings. Uh, let's see if there is any question either in the chat or online or in the room here. Let's see. Let me check the chat and have a look. Here I can't see anything. Natya, do you have a question? Okay, so I will switch off my mic. So oh, hi Alex, and thank you for your um, for your presentation. I must uh, say it's the clearest elaboration I had on on American uh, politics in in a long time uh, because being so far, it's difficult to to understand uh, the context uh, from afar. Uh, my question is uh, on the final result about concluding that uh, populism is a minor factor within Sanders electorate uh, and that many align with more clo more closely with social democrat and left libertarian values. And I was wondering to what extent and whether we have considered this is a particular uh, element of, um, of let's say, I'm not an American, so I, I am not sure I'm using the correct word, so correct me if I'm wrong, right? Um, so whether this is a result of, um, of of American culture, if you want, like I, I, I assume from what I see as an outsider that many Americans would be very uncomfortable with suggesting anything alternative to big corporations uh, in the same way we, we see all these discussions about taxing the rich uh, and, and these are things that traditionally make the American society uh, at least big chunks, big parts of the American society very uncomfortable. Um, so I was wondering whether instead of populism or not, the reason you have um, you have concluded might be affected by this historical, cultural, if you like, I'm not sure what is the correct here, um, element. And I, mm -hmm. just to give you another example of uh, a bit that, that came to my mind, well, uh, in Europe, we do realize uh, Senator Sanders uh, is very left wing for uh, um, uh, in terms of the American uh, political context. But now that you have mentioned that he actually follows a Nordic example, uh, that suddenly, at least in me, it helped me actually locate him somebody within the left right uh, spectrum. And and again, I think this is the result uh, of of. Uh, an American society that has never historically been to the extreme left uh, in any way. Uh, and, and again, I, I'm saying all this through my own uh, very foreign, uh, very uh, remote perspective. So correct me if any of that is wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, you are definitely right that um, Sanders is very left wing for an American politician. But when you look at 
uh, when you compare him to more Europe, particularly the Nordic model or, you know, some other European countries, he's not very left wing. You know, he's he would be more in, in line with the center left there. So um, and it is it is definitely true because part of the um um, because even Joe Biden acknowledged, which I mentioned here, that Sanchez has kind of made these issues and has kind of brought them forth, which were previously Amer the American public were rather uh, skeptical of and were rather uh, weary of. And, you know, because, again, throughout the 90s, it was the whole idea was um, among the Democrats was, no, we we can't go the quote far left route far left within American context. Of course, we have to go this third way, new Democrat or new labor approach if we want to compare it to the UK, because that's the only way how we win elections. And, you know, as, as a result of the financial recession and it, it definitely did bring about a, a sort of more criticism of, of this third way approach and th this basically allowed for bernie sanders to use this rhetoric of what, what we saw with occupy wall street and these criticisms to basically bring these um more i, I guess you could quote far right within american context uh no far left sorry far, far left within american context um to bring these issues more into the forefront and to gain more support from um on them from the people that previously if this were uh, 10 years ago, probably now, you wouldn't see it. I hope that answered your question. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nadia, for the question and a comment and Alex for answering. I'm trying to see if I see anything else in the chat of relevance to what we're discussing now, but I don't. Just a second, we have a guest coming now. Um, Alex, is there anything else you would like to perhaps share with the audience on? I was thinking about the uh, methodology or the work that actually uh, the the work that you had to go through. So is there anything striking about the methodology that you have used? Anything that you will take away as a lesson for future research? Mm. Mm. That's a good question. Well, as I said before, I focused more on the qualitative. My colleague Patrick focused more on the quantitative. Um, so I, I wish he was here to answer questions about quantitative. I. I can try my best to answer some, but uh, it's not my area of expertise. But um, what I definitely think is a good, um, I think the variables for populism, which um, we, we both decided the variables, by the way, and how we were going, what variables we were going to choose. We, we both looked through AN, ANES data together and figured out what would what questions matched you know, the populist attitude. So I, I definitely think that for future research, it's it definitely is important to have a very strong theoretical model like populism and that these theoretical models do exist even for these vague concepts like populism, which most academic scholars have told me, oh, the devil in defining populism, that's, you know, good luck with that. But I, we actually found, no, there are a lot of definitions that we can use here. And that, and that there is actually, it is definitely possible to use uh, not only qualitative, but also quantitative data as well, because I didn't, I, at first I didn't really know that this quantitative data existed for just these vague abstract ideas. And so, yeah, I definitely think that's probably the main takeaway that I got from this. Thank you, Alex. I think that, you know, I was very intrigued and interested with the variables that you came up with and, and the pops that uh, you actually used. I find it uh, absolutely fascinating what you what you came through. And, you know, um, these are these are pops that you can use in different ways. So one suggestion, perhaps following the paper 
is uh, you could create even infographics with those pops um, and and be able to communicate uh, more simply or you know the research because it's it's complex when you get into the quantitative analysis can be complex but uh, very very interesting thank you so much if no one has anything else to uh, say we have reached the end of the first day of the EU pop final conference it was a very rich day so I'd like to thank everyone who has participated today as a, either a speaker, as moderator, as participant. Uh, we really enjoyed it both here on campus, but also online. And we're happy that we have you know, gathered uh, so many different experts and so many different interests in the same virtual room. Uh, we would like to invite everyone to join us again tomorrow because tomorrow we have another very interesting day and a diverse day again. We start slightly earlier tomorrow, so that would be good for Dinesh, for example, who's in India, maybe a bit more difficult for others who are more uh, towards uh, the West. But uh, the first session is at 9 p.m. Cyprus, sorry, 9 a.m. Cyprus time. So I'm not sure what that translates into for most of you, depending on where you are. Uh, but anyone, anyone uh, further East would be okay with that. Um, so thank you very much. See you all tomorrow and uh, hope to talk to you again. Bye. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a very, very, our pleasure as well. Thank you, Alex, and our regards to Patrick. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye, everyone.